Hey everybody. This video, we're going to try to take you a little bit more in depth than we usually do. Um, we know a lot of people raise their egg laying hens differently, but in this video, we're going to focus on how to raise egg laying hens in a free range type system. Now, for us, the first consideration is going to be um, that we are in a northern climate and we're in Minnesota, and so a lot of what we talk about today is gonna to be based upon some of those factors. But we'll discuss all of the other factors that you might consider if you're in different areas as well. So the three main things we're gonna go over today are cost, climate, and environment. Those three things are really the three main considerations, and then there's lots of details under each, each one of those, but those are the three main considerations that you wanna think about as you plan out how you're going to do your free-ranging chicken operation. So let's dive in. Let's start with number one, cost. When we talk about costs related to free-range egg layers, um, really the first thing that is most important is how good are they at foraging? Now there's a lot of elements that go into creating a good foraging flock. But if you're focused on hens that really just lay a lot of eggs, um, chickens in general do a lot of other great things. But if you really want egg production, then your first thing you're gonna look for is a chicken that lays the most amount of eggs per year. Now, we found a couple of varieties that do this really good for our area are a California white for, an egg white layer, for a white egg layer and an ISA brown for a brown egg layer. They are probably the two in our area that work best for producing the most amount of eggs. But there's a second consideration on top of this that really comes into cost. At the end of the day, the cost per bird at the very beginning isn't very important. Because over the life of your bird, the number one input that you're going to be putting into your chickens is the cost of feed. Now chickens, especially egg white, or white egg layers, um, are industry birds. I mean, most people buy white eggs in the store, so they've been bred to be really efficient on feed uh, and to produce the most amount of eggs. So for a white egg layer, we like to use a California white, mostly because it's good for our area. It has um, the qualities that make it good for cold weather, but it also lays a ton of eggs. It has a really petite body size, um, and so that causes it to not eat very much. Um, it tends to be very, very um, lean on its diet. Now, any chicken is going to be, in general, a pretty good forager, but there are some things that you might want to do in order to encourage your birds um, to forage better. The first is a good compost pile. Um, a compost pile provides an opportunity for chickens to do two things for you. Produce value for you in producing good quality compost to put in your garden that you would otherwise have to buy in the store to supplement your soil. And the second thing is, is they can eat your leftover food scraps, which provides a means of uh, reducing the amount of waste and garbage that you're putting out of your house, um, but also supplements their diet with a more diverse diet. And the third thing is it also gives them something to do and to really um, express those instincts that they have to till the dirt and look for bugs and, and critters and things like that. Now we'll look at the inside of the coop and we'll discuss how we feed our chickens. Okay, so here we are inside the coop. Now what you can't see very well here is our feeder. Now I built this feeder right into the wall so that I can be filling it on the outside of the coop area. Um, and then it feeds also our ducks on the other side of this coop. But on the inside here, you can see there's an area that can be opened um, where the chickens can feed. Um, now you might wonder, well, why do you have a cover over it? During the day, we really want to encourage our, our chickens to get a little hungry. Um, that's what's really going to spur their desire to go out and forage. If you keep feed accessible to them all day long, their tendency is going to be to go to where the food is and not go very much farther. But you want them to explore. You want them to go out and find food. Um, so this is the primary way to prevent them from eating all day long. They'll go through a, a lot more feed doing um, having access to feed all day long than they will if you have an opportunity to cover it like this. A second way or a more common way to do this is to ration their feed and only feed them a certain amount every day. What I like about this though is it's not as much work, it's not as much maintenance. And it's a stationary system that if I go on vacation or something like that or I'm away for a weekend, I can leave it open and the chickens will have access to all the feed they need and I don't need somebody to be here to feed them on a daily basis. One more thing to consider with a feeder like this 
You should put your feeder inside a coop if you have a stationary coop on a bedding system like this. The main reason is, is they're going to spill some feed and that gives the opportunity for the chickens to eat the feed in here and they'll scratch and till in your bedding um, and pick up the rest of the feed. Whereas if you put the feeder outside, there's a chance it could get wet and the weather and things like that or they'll spill stuff out on the ground and it'll go to waste. Another really great benefit of a stationary coop is the opportunity to put your chickens on deep bedding. Now as you can see, the number one area where a chicken will produce um, poop is right underneath their um, roosting bars. In a stationary coop, this allows you to be able to combine a large amount of carbon-based mulch, or in this case we use wood shavings, which are relatively inexpensive, to mix with the, the droppings of the chicken. And the reason that's uh, a good thing is because the wood will help take out all of the smell and things like that, absorb a lot of the liquid and that kind of stuff that comes out with um, the chicken poop. And that it also serves as this great mixture for creating a base for your compost. Now, every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year, we'll come into this. We'll just keep adding compost throughout the year and keep layering it over the manure as it builds up. And then maybe once or twice a year, maybe in the spring or the late fall, we'll come in and we'll clean all of this out. And this will become uh, a, the main part of our mixture for our compost pile. And then in our compost pile, we'll mix in grass and leaves and other things and our food scraps from around the yard. And that'll make a pretty much ideal ratio for compost. And this becomes a super nutrient rich mixture that you can put on your garden and save all the money that you were planning on putting into your garden next year. So you want to talk about ways to make your egg layers really valuable? This is probably the best way. It'll pay for the majority of your feed. In addition to, if you have additional eggs, you know, depending upon the amount of chickens you have, I would say be very careful not to get too many chickens because the more chickens you have, the more expensive they are. Get, them, get the amount of chickens that you need to be able to satisfy your needs for eggs, but also to satisfy the need for maybe the ability to sell some of your extra eggs to friends and family. That's another way to recapture some of the cost of feed related to feeding your chickens. I usually don't recommend putting a water inside your, feed, your uh, chicken coop. The main reason is, is that the water, chickens will spill a lot, and especially if you have ducks and other things like that that are in your coop, um, but this type of water doesn't spill very much at all. And it provides maybe just enough spillage that uh, it keeps the compost nice and rich over in this area of the coop where the nesting bars aren't and there isn't much a liquid in the, in the um, compost itself. Um, but realistically, for chickens, especially in a cold climate like Minnesota where you have extremes of weather, both really hot and humid and really, really cold um, weather, you want your chicken coop to stay really, really dry. And so the deep bedding provides the means to do that, and having a waterer inside your coop usually isn't the best way to do that. But since we have such extreme cold temperatures, this type of water is about the only kind that's heated that will keep your water thawed out, even in those coldest of weather situations. So that's why we keep it inside the coop, to keep it out of the wind and the elements and to keep it from freezing. But this type of uh, waterer in general doesn't spill very much, so you're, so you're covered and keeping your coop dry. Another thing in our coop that you can see that's really important to getting good egg production is a, a nesting box that is low light where a chicken feels nice and safe and it's high and dry. So here you can see we do have a window but this is a north facing window so you don't get a lot of direct sunlight. But the window is important because it allows airflow. We can open this window and it allows airflow to go through the, the coop which is also really important for good quality of air and for keeping the chickens dry, uh, from preventing too much humidity from building up in here. Um, but, so this is a great spot. It doesn't have any direct sunlight coming into it, so the chickens feel like they're in a very protected and low light area, and then that will help your egg production. They still get light from the window, but not direct light, so they still feel safe and sort of uh, secluded. They don't want to feel exposed when they lay eggs. Their natural tendency is to hide their eggs in a place where they feel like their chicks are protected. Um, so that will help encourage laying. And then make sure you provide enough nesting boxes for all of your chickens to encourage them to lay in more than one place. A lot of chickens will want to just lay in one spot. So what you can do is if you get one chicken egg laying in one spot, you can spread the eggs around and the chickens will lay in the other boxes. But here you can see we have a chicken hard at work making chickens, uh, chicken eggs for us. Chicky, chicky.
So one thing never to forget about having chickens is you should enjoy it. It's supposed to be fun. If you're not going to enjoy having chickens, you probably shouldn't have them because that will reflect how you care for them. But for the most part, they provide a great opportunity, especially if you have kids, because they're really easy to take care of. And so you want to bring all of those things into mind when you design your coop and how things are laid out to make it easy for a young kid to be able to do a lot of the work. That's really where most of the joy comes in. And it provides a lot of teachable moments for kids and how to care for things other than themselves and to think about other things than themselves. And animals are a great way to teach kids how to uh, take responsibility for another life. So the difference between chickens and say like a pet is most of the time we don't want to think about chickens as a pet. And for your kids, it's really important for them to see the benefits of an input and output system uh, of owning animals versus just having pets at home, where it's mostly an in input, where you're putting food and time and energy into that thing. And really the, the main thing you're getting out of your pet is, is the joy and the, and the companionship, right? Uh, but with chickens, you're really teaching your kids how to be productive as well. And you provide them an opportunity to earn money in doing so. You can either pay them like a wage for, for doing the work, or you can allow them to be a part of the whole process and even sell the eggs themselves to some of their peers or possibly their peers' parents. Um, that's something we've done with our daughter from a very young age, and it's been a main source of income for her in, in order to save money for her future and to save money for things that she wants to spend money on. So there's a lot of joy in that too. The second point I wanted to talk about with the joy component is choosing the type of chicken. Now, as you can see, these chickens are pretty docile. And for the most part, one of the main components of choosing a chicken um, breed that's right for you is to consider how docile the breed is. Some of the breeds like California Whites, which we don't have any here right now, um, they're a little bit more flighty and spooky. Um, they don't tend to like to be as held as, as much, but there's a benefit to that. For a free range chicken, um, California Whites are great at evading predators and nothing will impact costs like losing chickens. You put a lot of time and energy and feed and money into your chickens raising them. To lose one is a big deal and a lot of eggs go with that chicken when they're producing up to 300 eggs a year. So in this case, the only thing I would say about choosing a docile chicken is it's really actually a pretty low importance because what's more important is how you raise the chicken. If you purchase your chickens from baby chicks, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to be very docile is going to be mostly dependent upon how much time and attention you give them, how much you hold them, how used to you they get. Um, it really isn't going to matter what the breed is. If you do that, they'll all be pretty docile and you'll be able to get close to them and enjoy them close up and in, and in person. Another thing to consider when you are choosing your laying hens is whether or not you'll be raising your own meat birds or not. Because if you are raising your own meat birds, you're not going to be looking at a uh, dual purpose breed or using the uh, laying hens after their egg laying lifespan um, or egg producing time frame um, for a meat bird of any kind. Um, so for instance, for us, in the past, as Andy mentioned, we have raised California Whites. So they're a lighter bird, they don't have a lot of meat on them. So once they hit their second molt, which is typically towards the end of their egg production time frame, um, their egg production will start to dwindle. It won't be the 320 eggs a year anymore. It might start dwindling down to 280, 250 and slowly you know, you're getting one egg a week from a chicken. Now, not to say that the chickens won't still have a purpose on your property, but if you're looking at the cost perspective, it's the, the input and the output isn't at that point really worth it, especially if they're a grain heavy breed. Um, for instance, this is a speckled Sussex. Great forager, they're docile and, um, 
<laughs> but once she hits the end of her egg production time frame, she'd be a better soup bird or broth bird um, than just kind of keeping around to eat grain. Some of the other breeds that are really great dual purpose are the black Australorps, Jersey Giants, the Brahmas are also really good because of their size. And then around here in Minnesota, because of their cold weather hardiness, are the Bard Rock. Now the spe Speckled Sussex are also pretty decent. They're on the lighter side if you are considering a dual purpose. Um, same for like the ISA Browns or the Red Stars. And the last consideration, but certainly not the least, is your time. Time is probably the most important thing to consider uh, in a system. Uh, when you consider overall cost. Your time is valuable and if you have a second job or something like that that's only part of, you know, you know if you're not full-time farming, um, your time is really valuable. And so for us, I have a full-time job outside of this. Um, we utilize the kids and get them involved to help me save time in doing some of the chores related to this work. That helps me out a lot. And having a chicken system like this where you have a stationary coop the kids can easily access everything they need to take care of the chickens. They can easily manage all the tasks and it's at their level. They can accomplish it. They can get that sense of reward in doing it. That helps save me a lot of time. Now you may be familiar with other chicken systems out there with mobile coops and things like that. They're not going to work super great for a really northern climate like this uh, because there's going to be a lot of inputs. So you're going to have to move those chickens on a regular basis because they're going to soil a spot pretty quickly and so that's a more intensive form uh, of raising chickens. If you're in the south and you're gardening more all year round and you're, you have a lot of garden beds and you want those chickens to move around, um, then it's going to be a great system for you. But again, it might be more time intensive than what you have availability for. So the tried and two method for allowing the chickens to do the most with the least amount of input from you is probably going to be a stationary coop. Now, now for the next part of um, this video, we're going to start talking about climate. And this is going to be the second most important thing to consider in, in having free range chickens. Okay, so when we consider climate, um, there's really not a whole lot to, to think about. It's mostly going to come into play when you choose what kind of uh, coop you're going to have, what kind of system you're going to build. Um, but the main considerations really are cold, hot, wet, and dry. Those are the four main components of climate that are really going to play the biggest um, factor in, in raising free-range chickens. So as we talk cold, we're in the northern climate, we get really cold winters here in Minnesota. Um, so a stationary coop tends to work the best for that because you can protect them the best. Um, it also works the best for defending them from predators, especially during the winter and times of the season like that. Um, the other most important thing really with, um, with the cold is keeping the chickens high and dry. Um, if a chicken's dry, it's not gonna worry, you're not gonna have to worry about things as much like frostbite. Frostbite tends to happen when you have a, an environment where your chickens are in and they're getting moisture buildup in their coop. Um, you can have a coop, a stationary coop, where that's possible. And that's usually going to just be a situation where there's not enough ventilation. Don't confuse ventilation with draft, though. You don't want your chickens to have a draft directly on them. You want them to be protected from, you know, wind and major air movement like that. But you want enough ventilation in your coop, similar to how you build a house, um, so that there is air movement inside the house, or inside the coop in this case. Um, if you have a really wet climate, um, a stationary coop might not be the best. Um, a coop maybe that's off the ground completely might be really good for you. Um, there's lots of different considerations there. When your chickens are free ranging and out and about in the grass, make sure you put your, your coop somewhere on the highest ground on your property. Chickens tend to like high ground. They don't tend to like swamps and bogs and, and low areas like that. If they can have access to water, it's a good thing, but not necessarily important. You can always take care of that with a watering system or with watering bowls or however you wanna manage it. So hot climates. Now in Minnesota, we get the worst of everything. Now as you can see, our, our coop is kind of not very protected right now uh, from the sun. It's right out in the middle of the sun. It gets basically full sun all day. So it has a tendency to get pretty hot in the winter. Now we have small young trees growing up around it right now. 
eventually those are going to shade out a lot of the sun and help shade the coop. Shading the coop is the number one thing you can do to keep your chickens cool during the hot parts of the year. And if you live in a hot climate, building your coop or putting your coop in an area where they can get to shade, especially if you're free ranging them where they're going to be outside most of the day anyway and the nights are going to be relatively cool, um, you're not going to have to worry about the coop being too hot. But your chickens are still going to want to lay eggs during the day. And so the ability for them to go in and out of the coop and not be too hot in the coop and be discouraged from laying eggs is going to be super important. So shade is probably the number one thing you can do um, to make sure that your chickens will lay all throughout the year, especially in hot weather. The second is airflow in the coop, like we talked about, making sure you have good ventilation and airflow. Okay, so we've talked about most everything related to um, climate in some of the other parts of the video where we talked about costs. A lot of these things are interrelated. Um, but for the most part, we've covered, I think, everything related to uh, climate. So let's go ahead and move on to environment. So we talked a little bit about environment, but the most important thing is really going to be a combination of cover and open grass. Chickens don't tend to like really tall, long grass, and they don't tend to like um, really wide open spaces. So it's kind of a combination. Um, for a free-ranging chicken, the best combination of things to have is spaces intermingled with shady areas or low-branching trees. Um, High-branching trees really aren't that great for chickens. They'll provide shade, which is good, but a lot of times birds of prey, like hawks and eagles and things like that, they'll come and swoop into a low branch of a large uh, shade tree or something like that and sabotage you know, the chickens or ambush the chickens when they're not really paying attention. Uh, we've had that happen before on our last property where we had large oak trees. Um, and so that's something to think about. Mostly shrubs and bushes and things like that are going to be great. You're going to find your chickens love to dig and scratch around those. They're great places for them to sunbathe and bathe in the dust and to give themselves a dust bath um, and to root around for, for worms and critters in the soil. Um, and then the grassy areas are going to provide things like grasshoppers and crickets and seeds um, from, from different types of grasses and all different types of plants. Um, and so a mowed lawn area like we have out here is good, but for the most part you're not going to find your chickens out, you know, wandering over a large area of mowed lawn. Um, you're going to find them more around, you know, trees like this or in areas like this with trees. Um, that's really where they're going to thrive. So another thing, a big thing to consider is how much space do you have? A lot of you are probably dealing with a really small acreage, so environment is going to mean you're going to need fencing. Now in our situation, free, mean, free range means no fencing. And we've put our coop in a very central location on the property, so it's far from our neighbors. But if you have neighbors, they're probably not going to appreciate your chickens coming over um, to, to their house to visit. If they're okay with it and you talk to them about it and they enjoy the chickens too, it might work out for you. And if you're in a town or like that that has ordinances that you can't have chickens and they have to be in a mobile coop or something like that all the time, then you have those limitations. Um, another thing to think about is if you have neighbors where you don't have ordinances and they're fairly close, if they have bird feeders and things like that, that's going to attract your chickens. So you're probably going to need to install a perimeter fence of some sort. And in most situations with a mobile coop as well, if you go with that direction, you're going to want some type of movable fencing or mobile fencing to provide a barrier for your chickens so that they can't move beyond the borders that you want for them. In our case out here, we have enough space that we can put the coop centrally and they have lots of rooms to spread out and lots of different areas that they can go to forage. One more thing about uh, a mobile coop and in, in your environment. Chickens, you can train your chickens early on in their life um, by keeping, by getting them familiar with their coop. Once they're familiar with coop, that their coop, that's home base. But it's not just the coop. They also tend to recognize the surroundings around the coop, and that is home for them. So you should never move your coop too far um, each and every day or uh, at any particular time, unless you're using fencing where you can contain the chickens around your coop. If you're not using fencing, your stationary coop is going to be home base. It's where your chickens are always going to come back to every night when you lock them up before dark. And speaking of dark, that's when most of your chickens predators come out. Make sure that your coop is an environment that is secure. Make sure that there are no ways for critters to get in, especially things like weasels, which are really good at getting in small places. Make sure it's a secure lockdown fortress for your chickens to be protected at night. The last thing I want to talk about is a run. If you have a stationary coop, do you want to run or do you don't want to run? 
in our uh, in our situation we don't have a run right now but we plan on having a run a run is really important if you ever want to go on vacation if you're planning on leaving the homestead a run provides a way for you to keep things like waterers outside the coop and to be able to do other things outside the coop allow the chickens to get access to the outdoor environment so in ours here you can see we have a cement slab ready to go our plan is to build mobile chicken tractors that we'll use for raising our meat birds during the summer when we don't really need the run um, we'll have the chicken tractors out raising meat birds but in the winter time we won't be raising meat birds we'll have our runs um, right next to our main coop and that'll allow our chickens to be protected from deep snowfall and things like that but they can still get outside and get some light and some sun sun is really going to help with egg production so that's an important factor make sure they have plenty of sun all right well that should do it for our video i hope you got a lot of really awesome points um, from this video i hope you learned a few things this is definitely not a comprehensive video on ch raising um, chickens but this is specifically about free-range chickens and I hope we, we showed you how we kind of do it here in Minnesota. And over the last seven years or so, this is what worked, has worked best for us. So hopefully it can help you. We'll see you guys in the next video.